Wonderful. Uh, thank you for your talk earlier, Nicola. Um, as a trans person, a lot of it kind of um, really resonated with me. And one of the things I think is really important about the Synod um, is this opportunity to listen. And you spoke about the process of having your identity recognised as a trans person uh, in the, was it the 1920s, around that kind of time. Um, what does the process look like in today's world for having your um, identity recognised as, you know, formally being diagnosed with gender dysphoria? Thanks. Well, I mean, I think it's a really complicated question. Um, I guess the first thing is I would probably want people to be able to think about um, recognising trans identity. Firstly, it's more than just a matter of being diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Um, the next thing is, I think it's important to recognise that trans identity also goes beyond the kinds of questions which end up being perhaps overemphasised to the um, like neglect of other aspects of transness. So often, when you say, "Oh, I can't identify, I can't acknowledge you as a trans person," because it means acknowledging something that I think is false about you. For example, let's just focus on this, like almost a metaphysical question or whatever about, you know, are you really a man? Are you really a woman? Are you really neither or both or whatever? And actually, firstly, I don't think that there's any one. Um, like definition of transness, which would end up providing the same answers to all of these questions, in the sense, particularly in the sense that not everyone has the same idea of what it is to be a man or a woman or non-binary or something like that, and people have different emphases on like how essential it is to them or what different factors like constitute those aspects of their identity. But really, what I'm interested in, or I think might be the most productive way for a conversation in a Catholic context to go, is recognizing that. Trans experience is about more than just how you think about yourself. It, it's partly that, and that's really important, but it's also about the way in which you move through the world and encounter other people, the kinds of desires that you have, the kinds of meanings that you're making in your life, and the kinds of meanings of your life that people make about you. And some of that will be to do with the ways in which your life matches the kinds of claims you're making about yourself. But some of that will also be about the ways in which your life kind of bears up tensions with what you're trying to do and what you want. And those experiences are really important too. As a church, we're called to have solidarity with the marginalised and to recognise the ways in which they're oppressed and have this kind of preferential option for them to hear them and to properly encounter them. And that means encountering them in all the different facets of their lives and not just the kind of hot button questions which kind of Great, thanks. Um, is everything? Oh, everything's okay. Good. Um, I'm going to open up to questions. I know that there were lots of kind of conversations happening outside. Um, so if anyone has a question, if you just raise your hand, and I will run over to you with the microphone right at the back. Great. Um, I'll touch on a few points I'll have to do it briefly. Um, I hope to just read into it more than the brevities. Um, opening up, you talk about the teaching of the church, and this can tend to imply whatever it is that comes down from the Vatican or academic theologians, but I, I think we need to redefine what constitutes the teaching of the church. I won't expand on that at this point. Um, also, my own theological conclusion is that all sexualities are equally valid, or put otherwise, equally as invalid, because I think this is all wrapped up in what uh, traditionally has been referred to as the fall. Um, I'm pleased you mentioned Pentecost, and in the early church, uh, the major <laughs> festivals weren't. Uh, Christmas and Easter, as they are now, they were Easter and Pentecost, and I tend to think they put it right. Uh, and I think this is an important issue in addressing matters of sex and sexuality, because I think we're all trapped on by the captivity of linguistic limitations and confusions. And the freeing of the spirit at Pentecost uh, wasn't about some translations had it speaking in foreign languages, it was about actually breaking through the barriers of language and transcending language. 
Um, so finally, I think where the church gets its theology right, then the rest will fall into place. And the trouble is that many of the tragedies of the past are embedded in awful, awful theology. Anyway, that's the end of my brief diatribe. And the rest of it is well. Thank you. <coughs> did you have a response? Yeah, I think. I think. No, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think one of the, the, the main focus of my talk was really on these conversations in a Catholic context. I mean, in some senses, I think, like, this is the sort of stuff that I'm really interested in, trying to figure out exactly what it means to talk about these sorts of things within the kind of, the, the specifically Catholic community, which is the one which I kind of emerged from as a theologian and things like that. But I think that you're absolutely right in that these are conversations which also need to be happening in the broader church. And we need to learn how to have these conversations across confessional boundaries as well. So thank you for kind of bringing those things together. I guess maybe there's one thing I slightly disagree with you on. It's the idea that theology is necessarily the thing that's eventually going to decide these issues. I mean, <laughs> theology is the church reflect, as I see it, is the church reflecting on its... Well, as a Catholic, I'd want to say sacramental life and the kinds of reality, divine realities and encounter within that. It's the church reflecting on its practice and it's reflecting on the insights which emerge in the course of its life conceived in a more kind of broad way. So I think that theology has an important role to play in this, but in some ways it's always going to play second fiddle to the often unsystematic um, and much more complex reality of just being the church in the world as both as institution and as community and as a kind of sacramental reality and things like that. And I think ultimately the, the theology might have a role, but it's also going to just be the way that the spirit guides the church and the way that we inhabit the church, um, sometimes without always having this kind of like ground up picture of how the church should be. Which is why I think it's really important to also have these conversations outside of theological contexts, because Ultimately, when people do come to a mutual understanding of one another and the church does like, become the alienations within itself, it's going to be because people have put that reconciliation into practice in their everyday lives, regardless of who they are actually within the church, and trying to pin it all on particular leaders or on theologians rather than big influential people and missing out on that really important aspect of what it is to be church in the first place. <coughs> Um, tragically, um, in the UK, there seems to be not a day passes by where trans women in particular are attacked in the secular media and to some extent even in the tablets, the liberal journal of the Catholic Church. Um, furthermore, uh, the theology of transness in, in, amongst the United States bishops is confusing. So could you clarify um, some of the theological um, issues surrounding trans, what the church teaching is or not teaching? Um, thank you. Thanks. So, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that in a Catholic context, there's no one definitive teaching on trans stuff, partly because um, no one sat down and actually tried to capture all the transness or whatever in teaching, but also because I see transness as a more dispersal sort of phenomenon that you couldn't just get at in terms of one teaching. Like, you can't think about transness without thinking about the ways in which trans people are marginalized, kind of apart from their like claims about themselves or how they access medical technologies, things like that. So um, yeah, I mean the the main kind of the kind of two main moments I think recently have been that Congregation of Catholic Education Guidance for Schools document, which maybe rehashed some prominent kind of political narratives in a less enlightening way. And then you have some comments from, for example, Pope Francis in um, some of the encyclicals about respecting nature and the intrinsic moral reality of nature, which then 
there's a kind of subtext which means that the stuff that he says kind of applies to trans medical care and things like that. Um, I think that there's some goodness actually at the heart of that, and that I do think we need to respect nature and not treat it as just an object of our wills. Whether that's a good analysis of what it is to be trans or access trans medical care or not is something which is maybe one that is areas of theological discussion which need to be had. Um, and I think that actually, if you look at the reality of trans life, it's not so simply that it like, seems like quite a caricature to view of it. In terms of other theological issues, I think. The church is still in the middle of a long process of learning to understand what it is to be a human, to be a human body. It's something which is really concerned it from the very beginning. I mean, what it is to be a body is at the very heart of, you know, people talk about, or Lumi Gentian talks about the Eucharist as the source and summit of Christian life. What is the question of the Eucharist, if not a question of what it is to be a body? Um, all of these questions, I think, there's a part of me that longs for the church to have a definitive answer to these questions so we can just leave these debates behind these controversies and just get on with our lives. But I think that many of these theological issues are the perennial ones. And what we'll do is we'll come to momentary kind of points of stability or insight, perhaps, or we'll just find a, um, which is kind of like a budget and everyone will get along for a bit, and then someone else will come up with a new theological question or whatever, and then there'll be another load of drama about that. And also the church exists in the world, and it's always going to be carried along by its kind of political, its political currents. So there are many different theological issues. There are no simple answers to any of them. But I think that the one which everyone needs to really bear in mind, actually, is the one which kind of lies at the heart of the church's vocation, and that is how do we approach the marginalised? How do we approach the poor? How might we, might we be excluding them from the church? And how might we be um, distancing ourselves from Jesus, who ultimately is to be encountered in them? That, for me, is the key theological issue. Lovely. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to have a reflection, but I'm wondering if you can talk to it. And it's about my own experience. And I say in the context of my developing understanding that theology and our small seat church, so the buildings, the rules, the gatekeepers, tail or dog, and who's doing the wagging, um, and which should be doing the wagging. And I think on my own therapeutic journey, I increasingly discover the way in which my small C church has required me to cleave apart as a gay man the various aspects of myself. And it was your comment about embodiment that, that triggered this thought. And I feel as if I have been required to separate my body, my sexual self, my spiritual self, my emotional, mental self, and all of the other selves that are in there. And it's like in order to conform to the model that I'm required to have played out in my life, that these aspects have had to be cleaved apart in order to perform to that model. And I spend this part, the remaining part of my journey, weaving all of that back together again. And the, the, the church, saucy church, to some extent requires us all as LGBT plus people to be disembodied in order to, to be part of that small city church. I wonder if there's anything you might want to say for that. <laughs> I think these questions of belonging and how we integrate our whole lives into the church are very difficult ones, in part because it's that very process of integration itself and what that would mean that's often the very thing that's up for debate in the first place. And it's hard to say exactly what it should mean to belong for the church, to the church, or what a good mode of belonging is on that basis. However, I do think that a really important factor in all of this is the ways in which um, this inclusion is enforced. We, you know, we, the church has had a very authoritarian history 
it still bears up those authoritarian structures within itself. And this is not me saying that I um, disagree with the idea of having a hierarchy or an ordained priesthood or whatever. I think that those structures are important and we've inherited them from tradition. But there is still a kind of violence that's often embedded in our communities, which makes us have to separate ourselves in a way that's painful. I think it's impossible to belong to any human community without, in some sense, always doing some self-censoring or some kind of conforming, because you know you're always reaching out to another who differs from you, and you're trying to create some bridge to them, which means stepping out of oneself, and in a sense, that means changing oneself. But that process of change can be one which involves growth and transformation and fulfillment. And it can also be one which involves, like you said, cutting off a kind of mutilating of yourself. And that's what happens when you're trying to reach out to, um, you know, an organ to structures, or organizations or communities, which places too much of a demand or very particular kinds of demands on you in terms of belonging and I think that that's where it really gets dangerous. I don't know how I feel about metaphors of tails whacking dogs or whatever because I under, I recognize that in those sorts of imagery there's an impulse to separate off the good church and the bad church and to identify the bit which you can find fulfillment in as like this is the true church and then the rest is like the noise and I think that this is important in the sense or these, these are good in the sense that they help us to frame our convictions and frame our you know, views of justice and frame our hopes. But on the other hand, I also think that there's a risk in that we do a similar splitting to the people that we're trying to encounter. And in some ways, then also helps us distance ourselves from the more troubling aspects of those others as we encounter them. I feel like there's no real simple solution to these issues because what this really means is that to an extent, to encounter, particularly in a church context, is always going to be painful. Um, I think there's a sense in which we have to resign ourselves to that, at least in the meantime, until we learn how to negotiate these things in a way in which everybody's dignity is actually recognised. Although I think the value in those images as well, like I said, it helps you frame your sense of justice and your frame of hope. And I think that another kind of corresponding part of this is also acknowledging precisely where those violent dynamics lies who at one point, at which point is truly becoming an object of that violence. And I think that this is something that all Christians should agree on as being like the responsibility of the church to address. And I think that this is maybe something that other people really can bring to the table as a group that historically have been subject, been subject to that kind of violence. So. <coughs> Uh, what touched me in your talk, well, a uh, number of different things, but uh, one aspect I would like to mention is uh, uh, this concept of de decolonization, which I think it goes in parallel with, uh, with uh, what, what we are talking about here, sin uh, synodal process, and you mentioned this word, uh, colonialism. Um, for the benefit of us, we haven't come across this concept of decolonization, but we become now aware that, for example, at universities around the world, we predominantly use textbooks which are written by people of a certain kind, certain background, or we study minority and in indigenous cultures through the eyes of dominant cultures, whether it's Anglo American or maybe we're talking about Eastern Europe, probably through the Russian eyes, we're talking about. Uh, in America, it will be through the Spanish, Portuguese uh, eyes, etc. But it's interesting that you brought this idea, for me it's interesting, I never thought about it, that you brought this concept uh, also into the area of trans people and uh, uh, and finding the voice. And what was powerful, personally challenging for me is to realize that uh, we all, all minorities probably have to <laughs> with dominant cultures in order to be spoken about them. Uh, a simple example I came across as a librarian, I came across that uh, in Britain, if, uh, if indigenous populations that are say in Russia want to be spoken about and written about, they have to agree that people here will talk about them through the Russian eyes and to use them uh, and the name them in that way, etc. Exactly the same as about my Belarusian culture. 
Yes, so to bring it back to the synodal process, what I learned from your talk is that uh, it's a reminder that how challenging uh, the Christianity and subversive Christianity is as a power, subversive power for this world. It should ask absolutely uh, very difficult questions that nobody else may dare even to think about. Okay, just a comment. Yeah, I mean, I think what, when writing the talk, I was drawing from um, a kind of particular kind of academic school of thought, which looks at these issues of injustice, for what we might call in the Catholic context, like exclusion in society, um, really in terms of language and what language is able to speak and what language is able to be found intelligible. And one of the most kind of famous renderings of this sort of general idea come from kind of post-colonial theory, um, the idea of the subaltern who are groups in society which um, you know, they can't even speak for themselves. It's not that they're not being heard, it's that their voices themselves aren't even intelligible because whenever we approach them, we approach them through a dominant way of viewing the world, which always already has kind of shaped what we're able to hear from them. And I think that this really illustrates the point which I tried to make and that um, actually a lot of these different experiences, even though they emerge out of very different contexts sometimes, there's a kind of resemblance between them. And recognizing these resemblances and the fact that there might be dynamics which at a certain level of abstraction resemble one another, even across these different experiences, is kind of really important for understanding the kinds of solidarity that we have, need to have with one another and to recognize our kind of common experiences and what we owe to each other. And also maybe having like a critical look at our own position in relation to them. Because I mean, one of the big thing, themes that you get around like LGBT stuff in a Catholic context is the idea that LGBT rights can be a vehicle of colonization or whatever. And I think sometimes this is used a bit disingenuously or at least in a bit of a one-sided way as just an attack on LGBT rights and as a way which ends up implicitly silencing all the LGBT people in that like context. But equally, it recognizing that we have this experience of silencing makes us realize that other people have a similar experience of silencing and that we ourselves can be implicated in the ways in which those other people are silenced. And that's a really important recognition. And I think that's something that you're kind of picking up on there as well, which is really good, like absolutely true. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, excellent. Uh, very, very exciting. So bear with me. Um, with the question was posed early on today about what the how is it that the marginalized functions in terms of being a teacher from the margin? And I think what we see in this model process is, and I thank you for your very optimistic view because I intended not to be particularly optimistic. I would like to congratulate the Bristol people on that paper which sent that because it was the most optimistic piece of work I've seen. But by and large, it's been the similar that they ignored or simply badly process. So this is immensely optimistic, but you understand, I understand now why. <clears throat> because in order to do it properly in the way that you outlined, it challenges your sense of identity. And what the margin does, of course, is if you've lived on the whole of your life and learned to understand who you are by being recognising that you're not included, that you've already had to go through decades of being discombobulated by what it is to be. To find, you know, in the sense I said earlier, the only thing we have in common is our difference. Why are we LGBTQ plus? Because we're trying to not make anybody dominant, we want to recognize everybody without being ridiculous in subdividing so often. But the synodal process, which is rejected by people because it calls into question their identity. If the only sense you have of your heterosexuality is that you're not queer, then these sorts of questions, really, being a stay at home mom versus a working woman, you know, that you get these kind of fracturing of the poor, and the closer you are to the center of, center of a very big group the more threatening this, these kind of questions and identities are. Can the optimism, do we learn to deliver with failure? People will be keen to say this is not the process has failed. But it seems to me the way you pose the questions, well, and using the text from the church in order to pose them, means that it's success just in framing the question. The optimism has to come from the fact that somebody had the courage to point out to people that their identity needs a close examination. 
Yeah, I think I agree with that. I mean, in terms of optimism and stuff as well, there are different ways of thinking about the success of the process. So, you know, people will come to or participate in this model process with the view of the sorts of changes that we need to see in the church. And quite often those might be framed in like a big picture way. You know, you want the Pope to write a certain thing in this apostolic exhortation or whatever. But the process itself also involves meeting people and learning from them. And, you know, a big part of discernment is not just figuring out what you want to do, but allowing yourself to be changed by the realization of what needs to happen. And that doesn't have to happen in this big picture way. You can actually just, you know, change the person that you meet and maybe slowly transform the culture in your local church. And that's a really important transformation too. I mean, the heart of the synodal process there's the conviction that the local is also important and that the universal church is as present in your congregation, your parish council, and your whatever it is that you're doing, as it is when, you know, Pope Francis is in St. Peter's in Rome doing all the fancy Pope stuff. So I think it's important to recognise that this novel process can be a success in this way, even if it's not a sort of a big success, it can still be a meaningful one. Um, thank you for the presentation. So um, I just wondered to what extent does the church uh, believe in science? And why I'm asking this is because if they do believe in science, you know, um, I have this story when I was in my part five in school. Um, Alan learns about the embryology and everything. I know um, um, I was taught by my teacher that it started with calling, calling it intersex. And then later they said, no, it's ambiguous genitalia. And then after that, oh, it's now disorder of sexual development. And then I remember this um, case where these parents brought this child, I think he was 13 years as a then. And then um, it can be complained that, oh, um, he's a man, but I started developing, you know, the female sexual secondary characteristics and all that. Because when he was born, there's a phallus, what we call phallus, and you know, and it was that dressing him like a man and all that, you know. So, um, <coughs> but it got to that point, they were like worried, there's this concern that um, he's a man, but why is it beginning to develop? And then they did a bad body test. And it was excess. They couldn't understand, but the daughter had to explain. Oh, during the embryology development, there was um, partially differentiation and all that. You know, the medical stuff. And now the management is well. If you want this person, this human, if you want him to continue as you want a man, then we could go on this, giving this medication. But if you want, then we could just do a reconstructive surgery that's plastic and all that. So, um, as the church talks of this and the scene, it's all about science. And if it is all about science, we then think about this marginalization stuff of let them, I mean, I don't know what, to what extent has this been, but I'm kind of speaking from my knowledge point of view and the whole process here. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so the church does say that it, to, to the extent that the church the whole can say anything, but the magisterium of the church says that there is harmony between faith and reason. 
and that there is no need for theology to fear science and that theology should respond to science and that Catholicism should be aware of and embrace science as a way in which our reason, our way of knowing the world can like share in God's knowledge and come to know the truth and then come to know God in that truth. I think there's a difficulty in cases of you know, like intersex or differences in sexual development or whatever labels people put on it. And I think that it's difficult because, well, firstly, I can't speak for intersex or people with differences of sexual development because I'm not one of them. But um, the way in which they experience these questions really reveals just how fraught the, I, the doing science itself can be. So a lot of people with differences of sexual development dislike the term intersex because they see themselves as, you know, conventionally a man or a woman, and then they see calling them intersex as putting into question that identification. Um, so they think, oh, I have a difference of sexual development, but I'm this kind of person. And I think that what this really um, highlights is the, the language that we use for people and the language that we use for these phenomena that we see in the world is all bound up in all these other like values and ideas of what it is to be human and what it is to live a good life in society. And this is true really of all science and these questions of sex actually have been bound up in these from the very beginning. So I talked a bit in my talk about um, John Money kind of preserving norms to do with masculine and feminine <coughs> by shifting them away from nature and putting them in culture. But then you also see some developments in sexology where people instead kind of went and gerrymandered their definition of maleness and femaleness to kind of drill down to um, concept, to drill down to like an understanding that's more clearly binary. And that's also like legitimate because when you account for the world, you don't just chuck out your best theory of the world because that seems to be a problem. You can also try and defend that theory and things like that. But what it really raises as a question, and this is what I think seeing this just as a question of, you know, what does the science say it obscures, is the fact that the way in which we approach the world is bound up in so many more other considerations and the way in which we know the world is bound up in so many more other considerations than just what are we seeing objectively in the world around us without applying us, imposing ourselves on it and stuff like that. And having a, um, a critical view of what it is to be a human who goes around knowing the world means recognizing that there are all these other significances to these questions as well. And we can't just pretend to be, you know, there's that figure from like early modernity, the scientist is like, I'm going to dispense with all faith, dispense with all like ideology, dispense with all culture, and just be this perfectly rational, almost sort of disembodied mind. I think that we also need to recognize that pretending that we're doing this when we're knowing the world is a way of also shutting out all those other important questions and considerations. And it's when you do that, actually, that that's when some of the greatest abuses are allowed to happen. You know, you have the idea that, oh, someone must be this or must be that. Therefore, we're going to surgically correct them. And this is what they need to flourish. And you don't necessarily pay attention to what they need. Or you tell them that that's what they need. And you convince them that that's what they need. And then they end up, like, really suffering and regretting it later, that kind of thing. So, like, these are all really important considerations, along with just does the church pay attention to science? Because science itself is a lot more complex than just being this disembodied mind and knowing the world from this sort of transcendent position or whatever. <clears throat> I think it's also fair to say, well, when the church talks about transgenderism or the gender ideology, it tends to stay away from conversations about people who are intersex. So there's still, there's still some recognition to be done there. Um, yep. Um, I can speak for the rest of the UK, but I definitely know where I live in Scotland. The rest of Scotland, um, there's a, a kind of dire need for change in the church, um, especially with the garden center, because a lot of parishes are closing them, but they can't do all the Victorian parishes. They've not got the money in the constitution to keep them going, the decisions of the 
someone has to close. So do you think that the sustainable process that will be a dying need for change and recognising the problems of trans people and LGBT people? Because I was talking about a couple of years ago, it's like I was a devout Catholic when she was about 13, 14, but now she's having doubts about her faith because of the lab and thing like it, sexual lady, and because of you know, the, the church um, saying that homosexuality is wrong and all this. So do you not think that the, the, the sustainable process well, start to include people because the magazine, the Catholic Conservative newspaper, is closed down because so few people were buying it. So, do you not think that there's going to be a dying need for change anyway in the church that not just for trans people but other people that have maybe judged and excluded in the past, LGBT and elsewhere? I think just, just before I pass it over, one of the conversations we had in the Diocese of Nottingham was that we're probably going to struggle to reach the actual people you need to reach in terms of the Synod, uh, and that's something that we haven't found an answer to. I do think that there's a dire need for change in the Church. I couldn't say exactly what that change needs to be, because I think that one of the conversations that we need to include people in is the conversation of what the church needs to be like. And, you know, one of the goals of the synod is precisely to do that. In fact, it's not even to do that. It's a synod on synodality. It's to decide what we need to do to have the discussions to then decide what we need to do in the church. So we're not even there yet. I think it, it's... The church is definitely facing a crisis in the UK today in that it's dwindling. You know, congregations are aging, people aren't staying in the church when they're born into it, people aren't coming into the church either from the outside. Sometimes I think that maybe, you know, when you think, when people think about the relationship between the church and the world, they sometimes respond to this by saying, well, the church needs to be like more integral to its teachings and not make any capitulation to the world and talk about the idea of, um, you know, like scandal, the idea that people might get the wrong impression of church teaching and suddenly think that it's okay with things that it's not officially been okay with for most of its history and that sort of thing. But I think that maybe this problem, you know, part of it's just because people just don't see the world in these ways anymore. And I don't necessarily think that this is something that the church can necessarily address in, um, by, you know, you're never going to find like a good argument for the belief in God or something. Like people have been trying for thousands of years and it's just not really worked out. That's not the way that people approach faith and stuff. <laughs> but I think that the real scandal which the church needs to really recognize is that people now, when they look at the church, they don't think, or they, or they, they, they don't think that if a loving God does exist, they'd be able to meet it in the church, or they'd be able to meet that loving God in the church. That's the real scandal. That's the real challenge, which I think the church can begin to address. We won't convince people that God exists, but we can work to convince them that if God does exist and God is as good as we say he is, that we'll be able to find him within our doors. And I think that that is the real task facing the church going forward. Uh, I know that there are a few more questions, so do come and find Nicolette uh, at any other point and have a conversation if that's okay. Um, I just finished on the, um, as we're talking kind of about the synod and what, what needs to happen. Um, what are your hopes for the future, in particular for trans Catholics? Um, you know, what do you hope the synod brings out for people like us? I mean, I hope that we can at least witness to the possibility of our being in the church. <laughs> not just to other people, but to ourselves. I mean, this is, it's amazing for me to be able to come to this conference and see all of you sitting here, um, including like trans people among you. And you're here because you're, like not just because you're like LGBT, but because you're LGBT Christians, and many of you are specifically LGBT Catholics. You're showing that there is a group who everyone would normally assume would only could only be alienated from the church, could never find joy, could never find meaning, could never find like love in it. And you're showing that actually that is possible. That in that regard, the church both has a kind of a good and bright and hopeful nature now, and that there's a possibility for that to continue into the future. I hope that this is what the synodal process can really bring to light. That when people think that it's not possible to be a Catholic in a certain sort of way, or that Catholicism must look a certain sort of way, 
or that you have to understand yourself as a Catholic in certain sorts of way. I hope that this novel process can help people recognize that the truth is so much larger and more complex and more welcoming and inclusive and loving than people actually think it is. If, if there's one thing that I will hope the church comes away from this model of the process with, it's that not just like, you know, I hope I hope the church comes away with a good understanding of what it is to do all the stuff that you could write about in a paper document or whatever. But I hope beyond all things that people can also just become acquainted with and inhabit this truth that the church is actually a broad church. There are so many more people in it and so many more kinds of people in it than people might otherwise recognize without it. Great, thank you. If we can uh, put our hands together to thank Nicolette once.